heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, full market coverage ahead. Stocks, crypto pushed to record highs. We'll discuss Bitcoin at 70,000 and the outlook for the AI rally as Nvidia adds a trillion dollars to its market cap this year alone. Plus, we'll bring you exclusive reporting on Huawei's chip breakthrough, which used technology from two U.S. suppliers. Details ahead. And Microsoft says it's seeing signs hacker group Midnight Blizzard has been attempting to gain access to its systems. We'll have the latest, but first, let's check in on these record high markets. This is a confluence of macro data that paints the picture of a resilient labor market, but that isn't so hot that the Fed can't start to pull back on rates. The ECB potentially signaling that way as well. We, of course, now see six tenths of a percent higher on the Nasdaq as we finish up this week. A new record high for the Nasdaq, a new record high for the S&P 500. This isn't just tech. Yes, tech leads the charge. Yes, AI is the area of focus, but across industry groups, we see the S&P 500 push higher. MSCI Country World Index, this is a global rally. This too, global benchmark at a new record high. Move on, what else do we see eclipsed? The record that we saw on Bitcoin and we get a new number. 70,000 is where we managed to push up to. Just briefly, we are back down to that 67,762, but still the risk asset of choice right here on the show, Ed, seems to have legs. What have you got going? Uh, a lot of things moving in real time, and there's a lot of news in this program. Let's start with Rivian. Still a day two kind of feel-good vibe after it unveiled its R2. We'll talk about it later in the program. For me, the big news, pausing plans for a new factory in Georgia. Clearly, that's what the street liked. Broadcom earnings, sales missed in the quarter, but they're up grading, I guess, their outlook for this fiscal year, saying that AI is going to contribute to growth 35 percent. Previously, they said 25 percent. These are the two U.S. chip making uh, chip equipment makers that are implicated in this uh, scoop from from Bloomberg. Right. So we're reporting, according to sources, that inside the Huawei Mate 60, that seven nanometer processor that was made by SMIC, SMIC used equipment from those two companies to do it. We will go to DC and we will talk about why that is so important. You mentioned it at the top. NVIDIA is a name that we have to take a look at. There is continued momentum in this name. It too has exposure to China, but there's not the same concern for whatever reason. I bring this chart up because year to date, $1 trillion of value have been added to, to NVIDIA. There's just momentum that's unstoppable, but they justified it with earnings. And in seven or eight days' time, they'll have their annual developers conference, GTC, where I'm hearing they will also have more big news. It's just unstoppable, Caroline. But they don't have the negative surroundings around China. Let's get back to that story. A Bloomberg exclusive, Huawei and its partner SMIC relied on U.S. technology to produce an advanced chip in China last year, according to sources. The previously unreported information suggests that China still cannot rely entirely on its domestic supply chain and needs foreign components and equipment that's required for cutting-edge products like Semiconductor. The reporter that broke that news, Bloomberg's Mackenzie Corkins, we just showed the teardown video that Bloomberg did of the Huawei Mate 60. It has a 7 nanometer processor from SMIC. SMIC used LAM and applied materials, chip-making equipment to do it. Tell me the rest. That's right, Ed. So this seven nanometer chip was lauded as a massive breakthrough in China. The U.S. was trying to keep Beijing from getting seven nanometer technology on the fear that it could give the country advanced AI capabilities that could lend it a military edge. And so we've seen the U.S. implement this sweeping set of controls on the types of chips and semiconductor manufacturing equipment that can be shipped to China starting in October 2022. And the machines that we're reporting were used to create this Huawei chip were shipped prior to that ban. But the through line on this story is that despite Beijing's efforts to indigenize the full semiconductor supply chain and catch up to the United States, to the Netherlands, to Japan, these countries that are really dominant in the global chip industry, to get to their most advanced chip yet, they still relied on foreign technology. Mackenzie. We know that the U.S. is still applying pressure to, well, ultimately, 
those other countries that they want to ensure that these sort of ways of navigating through the blocks don't still happen. They are turning to the Netherlands, to Japan, to squeeze even tighter. What then of these indigenous makers over in China? What then of advanced microfabrication equipment? What then of Naura? Are they actually getting to a place where they could do it alone? It's an excellent question. I certainly the hope from the US, uh, the Netherlands and Japan, which are part of this tripartite agreement to squeeze China on semiconductor technology. They hope that the, uh, the, the controls that they've already imposed will keep China from ever catching up. But the reality is there are significant differences between the controls imposed by those three countries. U.S. firms are not allowed to send their employees to service equipment that's already in China. So these tools from LAM and Applied Materials, those employees can't go do repairs. But their right. Dutch and Japanese peers are able to in many cases. So there are still sort of big gaps that the U.S. seeks to close between those three countries' regimes. And then you have the U.S. reaching out to South Korea and Germany, which are major or home to major producers of spare parts that go in chip making tools to get them to join in on this accord and try to squeeze China further. So just really quick at a point of clarification that seven nanometers, two generation removes from the cutting edge, right? Three nanometer. But as you point out in your story, Mackenzie, SMIC obtained the lithography machines prior to that October 2022 ban. So I think there's more to go on this story, which I'm sure you'll look into on how they get that domestic uh, industry up to speed. Bloomberg's Mackenzie Hawkins, terrific reporting. Thank you. Uh, let's keep the conversation going. China is in the process of raising more than $27 billion for its largest chip fund to date, accelerating the development of cutting edge technologies as it faces those restrictions on U.S. tech. Known as the Big Fund, the state-backed firm is expanding as the U.S. prepares to sharply escalate technology curbs designed to curtail Chinese chip and artificial intelligence progress. A tit for tat going on here, Caroline. And one that investors have to navigate around. Are we still looking to put more money to work in companies that have significant exposure to China? NVIDIA being one of them. Let's talk to someone at the cutting edge. Nancy Tengler, I'm pleased to say, joins us. CEO, CIO of Laffer Tengler Investments. For more, also the author, of course, The Women's Guide to Successful Investing. You dive into where women must invest for their future. But most notably today, you're joining from the CBOE a day after ringing the bell to celebrate not only International Women's Day, but also the launch of your new ETF, TGLR. We want to dig into the ETF in a moment, Nancy. But first, your take on China, US, and how it factors into your investing thesis. Yeah, so it, it's a tricky one to navigate, clearly, Caroline. Um, our portfolios have about five, uh, three to five percent exposure in terms of revenues to China. So we've been very careful about it. And of course, the companies that have tended to underperform in the last year have been the companies that do actually have exposure to China, not just in technology, but across the board. So. I, I'm not as concerned about the $27 billion chip fund that China's starting. I mean, I think that's pretty much what Intel spent in terms of R&D and CapEx last year alone. So the, it's, it's, a, it's a drop in the bucket, but you do have to be aware and conscious of the fact uh, that, that there are going to be continued um, hostilities, if you will, trade hostilities. Which might factor into whether or not we pull back from these record highs. Nancy, we are talking to you when the Nasdaq's at a record high, the S&P 500's at a record high, Global World Index at a record high, thanks to the likes of NVIDIA. It's interesting that we have Broadcom, for example. I know you've sort of called it the poor man's version of an NVIDIA, but there is some weakness in that name after its earnings. How are you ranking the AI frenzy and the chip names to be owning? So if you, if I, I think I've shared with you our investing theme is old economy companies that are embracing AI and then the suppliers of the picks and shovels. So we, we have been expanding our exposure. We trimmed back on many of the names, including Broadcom and Palo Alto Networks a, a number of weeks ago and then again yesterday. And, and so I think you have to be disciplined in this environment. We still own plenty, but we've been adding to names like uh, AXP. I have, I have a triple A um, or A cube stock pick for you, and it's, it's American Express, which is using AI to improve fraud detection, uh, and then Amazon and Adobe, the unsung hero, we think, of AI. So you have to pick and choose and navigate around uh, the, the, and really focus on domestic revenues if you can. 
The thing about Broadcom is it's not a, ma a maker of AI accelerators right, Nancy. It, it kind of, it has a custom right. silicon business, makes TPUs, but it's really in the server design build out. You know, it provides networking tech. Uh, but they, they had this specific right. forecast that AI will be 35% contribution to revenue, up previously from 25%. Does that signal anything bigger to you about how, we, how continued or sustained the AI build out is going to be? Um, I think, I mean, you have to piece together from a lot of different companies, but I think that the security I have in owning a name like Broadcom is that it is, Hoctan is consistently underestimated. We were buying the stock at $200 a share uh, when, when he did the Computer Associates deal and everyone hated it. It was accretive in a year. So there's more to Broadcom than just AI. But if you look at the use cases, almost, you know, we're sitting on earnings season. Everybody's talking about it uh, across sectors, but they're really using AI. And I think that's why I think this market is analogous to the 90s, because we are going to continue to right. see productivity improvements. And that's going to drive stock prices higher. I would just point out, I didn't answer Caroline's question. I mean, if you look at the all-time highs, yes, that's true, Caroline. But... It, over the last two years, if you got, went 22 to 23, the NASDAQ was actually down something like 3%. So we're, we're not in nosebleed territory yet. Well, the, co the difference is the contribution from NVIDIA. NVIDIA is at $927 a right. share. Stock split? Stock split NVIDIA? Yeah, please. <laughs> so you would favor that? You yeah. think you'll go for it? I mean, they've done it before, so I, I think it's likely. I, I, I think it would be great if Broadcom split as well and some of these other stocks that trade at these, you know, really high levels. It makes it harder to, to manage uh, portfolios with them in the portfolio, harder for the retail investor. But, you know, we'll take what we get. We'll take dividend increases. We'll take share buybacks, whatever it takes to drive the stock price higher. And let's talk about the retail investor. You clearly care about them. You've been writing books for them, and you've also been looking at well, now we've got an actively managed ETF coming from you at the moment. Lafatengla Equity Income ETF, high quality, large cap stocks that have strong earnings and dividend growth potential. What is your edge here, Nancy? Where do you want to be showing and offering to this clientele? Yeah, so this, this strategy is very different from what you would normally think of as an equity income portfolio. There's no electric utilities. We own one REIT in the portfolio. Uh, but, but we buy what I call fallen angel growth stocks. And we do a lot of research because everybody knows the problems when the stocks are out of favor. So we have our own proprietary research model and our own proprietary valuation metrics. And that is the one we use in that portfolio is relative dividend yield. In these companies, management sets the dividend based on what they think long-term sustainable earnings earnings power is. So it's a total return strategy with dividend growth as the focus, and it's a great workhorse strategy. I have, you know, the majority of my assets in this strategy. So you don't get to own some of the sexier names, but you do get really consistent risk-adjusted returns um, that have been able to generate excess return above the benchmarks so, over time. Nancy Tangler, CEO, CEO of Lapa Tangler Investments. Great to have you on the show on this Friday, and congrats on the ETF. All right, coming up, Microsoft says Russian hacking group Midnight Blizzard is making attempts to access its systems. We're going to bring you all the updates on that story next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Time for Talking Tech. First up, Microsoft says there's evidence that information from an account compromised by a Russia-linked hacker known as Midnight Blizzard was used in recent weeks to try and gain access to corporate data. In a blog post, Microsoft revealed that the hackers made attempts for some of the company's source code repositories and internal systems, but found no evidence that any customer-facing systems were compromised. Plus, semiconductor connectivity company Astera Labs is said to be planning to raise as much as $534 million in an IPO. The Intel-backed company hopes to tap into investor demand for artificial intelligence with a stock offer of $27 to $30 a share. That's according to a filing. The stock will trade on the NASDAQ and will debut under the ticker 
A-L-A-B. And Rivian hits the brakes, halting plans to build out a new multi-billion dollar factory in Georgia. In a company filing, Rivian said the move will save the automaker as much as $2.25 billion in capital expenditures. This coming as EV Maker debuted its first mass market R2 model, which will now be made at first in its existing plant in Illinois. This was uh, the Rivian CEO, Caro, sort of channeling his, his inner Steve Jobs, but the news was a change of plans. He was channeling the inner Steve Jobs with a surprise, right? The R2, yes, we kind of had the leak on, but tell me about the R3. What did you make of it? Yes, the R3 is a crossover. They did keep it a secret. I'm so surprised it wasn't leaked, frankly, ahead of time. So it was kind of like the one more thing, Steve Jobs moment. <laughs> uh, the it, it's a prototype. It's a prototype, right, far in the future. But it did boost the stock. We'll see what the price point is. But what, 45000 for an R2? We're starting yeah. to get a little bit more economical. Meanwhile, coming up, look, as AI the answer to even evaluating job candidates? Is it doing it fairly? We've got such a brilliant deep dive. Bloomberg analysis finding that the generative AI platform ChatGPT may not be as objective as some might think. I'll have more on that for you next. This is Bloomberg Technology. AI is helping drive stocks to new highs today, but there remains the ongoing concerns about its limitations, particularly when it comes to generative AI and ethical standards, safety. This is something I discussed with the CEO of Salesforce AI. It's Clara Shee. Take a listen. There are so many ways of thinking about trust. Um, it is something that I think about all the time. It's, it's the number one company value at Salesforce. But when it comes to AI, I think we've all heard the stories of ChatGPT and, and the various equivalents out there just making things up or spewing out toxic outputs or biased outputs, right? Because consumer chatbots are trained on the corpus of data on the internet. And so, humanity, unfortunately. And humanity. And there's a lot of incorrect biased information out there. And so I think that's really the difference between consumer AI and business AI. In business AI, it's just unacceptable to make up an answer to what, what your sales forecast is or <laughs> responding to a customer service request. And that's, that's why our team, my team, has spent so much time building out what we call our Einstein trust layer. So everything from data masking to citations to zero retention prompts so that there's no data leakage to keeping an audit trail just to make it really trusted for companies. What about, therefore, the developers you're then going out and talking to on a day like today? Where are they seeing worries about what they look like, the bias within what they're producing? Or are you seeing a more diverse cast of characters coming and building, particularly as you make AI easier with co-pilots? The fact is that ultimately maybe we're not all going to have to be, well, coders, let alone prompt engineers. <laughs> I do think this is an amazing democratization moment for app developers. And I mean, even for years before AI, Salesforce, one of the secret sauces of Salesforce was its no, was its no code and low code platform, which means that business analysts can build apps without knowing how to code. And even pro code developers who are really good at coding, they're able to use our tools to, to code faster. And AI is just an incredible accelerant and amplifier of both of these. And so today we had a, a series of really exciting announcements called our Einstein One Studio that really makes it turnkey for any no code developer as well as pro code de developer to use AI to build faster. Do you think that the AI systems that we're building right now are as diverse as the use cases that we're having? And, and, or are you worried about the bias that's in there inevitably because of what it's ingesting? I think more broadly, we should all be very concerned about the AI model development and the regulation of AI not being diverse enough. And that's why I think it's so important for us to have rooms like this and dialogues like this to really ensure that a diverse set of perspectives are going into creating the AI itself as well as creating the governance and the policies and the regulation around responsible AI. And then finally, you know, AI is going to create tremendous wealth and value for shareholders, for stakeholders, for employees of these companies, for the people and the businesses that utilize AI. And we can't leave behind women and minorities in this value creation moment. My conversation a couple of days ago with the Salesforce AI CEO, Clara Shee. Ed, we're going to dig in more.
Yeah, let's stick with AI bias concerns and turn to today's Bloomberg Big Take. Our reporters have been working on an experiment to see if ChatGPT has any discriminatory biases, finding in their conclusion that AI software can produce discriminatory results when prompted to rank resumes that are equally qualified. Let's bring in one of those reporters, Bloomberg's Davy Alba. This is a must read, but it is complicated. Let's start with the methodology first. Explain to the audience what you did. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. Um, so we carried out this experiment where we used uh, GPT's um, API. And so we prompted GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 with eight equally qualified resumes, keeping all of the qualifications of the resumes equal, equivalent, essentially. And the only thing that we changed was the name that was on top of the resume. So that name, we derived it using computational methods and, and made it representative of particular demographic groups. So we had you know, either ma male or female, white, black, Hispanic, or Asian demographically distinct names. And we set it loose and we basically had GPT rank uh, these resumes uh, thousands of times for four different jobs. And what we found was actually some pretty stark evidence of racial bias and disparities, uh, depending on the job that we asked GPT to rank it for mm -hmm. and, um, you know, sort of the, the, the candidates that it was evaluating. Okay, so you're looking for a financial analyst, for example, as one of the examples. Yes. Who ends up, in probability, coming out on top? Who ends up coming off worst? Yeah. So that was one of our really good examples. You know, we found that black men and women were disproportionately ranked uh, sort of at the bottom. They were chosen uh, as a top candidate the least frequently. Um, and it was so stark that we actually measured adverse impact which is sort of what the US federal agencies use as a benchmark to see whether a group is, you know, badly impacted by a particular hiring process. Um, and, and I wanted to add, this is not just theoretical that people are using GPT to use these, to, to, to use to sort of sort and um, rank resumes. We actually, in our reporting, found that a lot of businesses are indeed using it for this particular use case. And, um, you know, it's, it's important to, to consider these things. OpenAI in response saying, you're not meant to use ChatGPT or GPT and our underlying technology just straight out the box in this way, but still stark reporting from Davy Alba. We thank her and the team so much for it. More to come. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. We've got to get you to check on these markets because they are at record highs across the board. This is a macro picture that feeds into the micro. It has been AI that leads us higher. But notably, we are thinking about a Federal Reserve that will eventually be able to cut rates later this year. We are thinking about a jobs number that shows resilience but is downgraded in previous months that shows basically we can cut into this economy and Europe seeming to signal a similar thing too. I'm looking over though, the Nasdaq 100 turning to the red now. We're currently off by six tenths of a percent. But the MSCI or Country World Index has been on the higher side. It looks as though we're managing to be dipping into the rest of the trading days. So having been at those record highs, the Nasdaq 100 now I'm pushing down a little bit lower. Bitcoin, remember, managed to eclipse $70,000 in earlier trading. We're now at 66 spot 953, so 66,959. So as we saw when we hit the previous record, it does manage to push up and then pull back somewhat. What's leading us to the downside a little bit at the moment? Well, we have known that it have been in the odd set of earnings that disappointed. They are looking over at Broadcom. We're off by more than five 
5% now. This is a company that had not lived up to expectations when it comes to the growth. This was another AI darling, has been driving ever higher, up 25% year to date. Perhaps gets the pullback as it says, yes, AI demand is there. But for now, well, the previous quarter showed that it wasn't enough to make up for missing expectations in other parts of the business. Apple, for interesting point of view, is actually finally higher after a couple of weeks of trading lower off, up by 1.7%. Not enough to counteract NVIDIA that is now tumbling some 3.7%. We had been trading higher on NVIDIA. This had been what led us to new record highs. But look, profit taking, volatility, we'll dig into the reasons why in a moment, Ed. But we've got more on AI to come. Yeah, that's weird, by the way, on NVIDIA. Literally, like, dropped a percentage point in the last five minutes or so. We'll find out what's going on. Uh, let's keep today's jobs report in mind, but dive deeper into the tech se sector angle to all of this and bring in Jacqueline Rice Nelson, CEO of the upskilling platform Tribe AI. Basically, uh, unemployment two-year high, but hiring continues. I'm going to try and make the jump to what's happening in AI in the context of that by saying... There is a scarcity of roles uh, or, or a scarcity of the skilled workers we need to meet that hiring demand in the AI context. Do you think that that's right? First of all, I'm thrilled to be here and especially on a day that shows some of the potential of AI and value creation that I believe we will continue to see in the market. Uh, I, I think uh, when you talk about AI and talent and opportunity, um, we can't really underscore um, that we're just at the beginning of this massive wave. Um, and, uh, and, and today, we absolutely have steep specialists who have been living, breathing, sleeping AI um, uh, for, for years. Um, but what really matters right now is who has been doing on the ground generative AI applications built on top of these large language models. These models have only really been accessible to a broader population for a year. And so that population of people who really has the experience that companies actually need to do this well, to do this right, is limited. Okay, what is Tribe seeing in, in the jobs market? We, we know jobs are being added, added in this context or industry, but what are the roles, right? All these companies are saying, we're using AI, but who are they hiring as a result of that? Yeah, this is a, an incredibly interesting moment because I, I believe we are kind of at a, a real inflection point where the conversation around AI has been around efficiency, around cost cutting, and, and potentially the fears have been around uh, job reductions. And I believe where we're headed is that um, there will absolutely be efficiency gains, but that's going to become table stakes. Where we're going is AI used for innovation, for product growth. Examples like ServiceNow using AI and already being able to cite quantitative value that it has contribute, con contributed already millions of dollars to net new ACV. Um, and this is where I think we have the potential to look at value creation from AI, not just on the bottom line and the top line, but also on jobs and opportunities for people uh, that extend far beyond just the builder themselves, but also the people who are thinking about the commercial implications of these technologies, the legal and compliance implications, um, the operational challenges, the data and back-end engineering needs. There's so many pieces that we're really looking at AI as a new wave to how do you develop products and how do you commercialize those products. And that's the interesting conversation. About. And it's also therefore interesting that basically you've gone in with a consultancy model because it feels right. as though you have to be integrated into every single part of a business now. I mean, this is going up from the CEO and the CTO but to basically people who are going to be practically using this. How do you, how do you get that buy-in from a company in every part? You're exactly right. And I would actually say it starts even higher, which is at the board level. Mm -hmm. So right now, all the boards are yelling at their CEOs and saying, what's your AI strategy? All the CEOs are yelling at their team and saying, what's your AI strategy? And everyone's saying, I don't know. Um, less, yes. Yelling, less yelling. Yes, less yelling across the board. Maybe they're nicely asking. <laughs> but the point is that 
Every company today wants or needs to become an AI company and they don't know how. And that's really where Tribe comes in. Um, we can help meet and work with companies at every stage of that kind of adoption journey and then work with them to build products that actually matter for their business, that really add real value to their companies, can showcase the success and make it really tangible rather than this you know, buzzword soup, um, and then get them on this sort of train or journey to continuing to invest in AI in ways that really make sense and do real things. The demand is clear, and I'm sure your business is thriving on the back of it, but talk to us about the supply side issue. You've got to bring in the right engineers who I am sure are being offered plenty of permanent jobs at extraordinary offerings in terms of their salary. Why work with a Tribe AI? Why be a consultant? Why be a freelancer? Yeah, this is a trend that I spotted years ago, um, which is that the people who really have the expertise, particularly in AI, have worked at just a handful of companies. Google, Amazon, Netflix, take your pick. Um, and uh, not everyone wants to stay at those companies, despite the cushy jobs and the large salaries. Um, and especially right now in this moment of intense AI demand that you just described, the demand for these talented folks is, is off the charts. And so they uh, have their choice of these very massive bloated salaries right now at these big companies, but that comes with a lot of bureaucracy, that comes with uh, being tied up at that company and, and potentially some IT, I, um, IP constraints um, you know, that they can't really innovate outside of their jobs. Um, and if they are independent, what they come to Tribe for is the opportunity to really plug in on the work they're best at, to not do any of the like boring meetings and bureaucracy stuff, but do the hard engineering that they know how to do better than anyone else, add a ton of value, and there's a lot of mutual value where companies are getting outsized value from working with the right AI engineers who have the on-the-ground experience to deliver value, and the AI engineers are getting tremendous learnings from working at the cutting edge and bringing these models to life in production at scale. Jacqueline Rice Nelson, so great to have you on. Great to see talking you. about well the fixes that are coming and actually how you can try for real productivity with all this AI hype. She's of course CEO of Tribe AI. Let's stick with, of course, all things artificial intelligence because it got brought up last night. State of the Union, President Biden calling for a ban on AI voice impersonations. Pass bipartisan privacy legislation to protect our children online. Harness. Harness the promise of AI to protect us from peril. Ban AI voice impersonations and more. And keep our truly sacred obligation to train and equip those we send into harm's way and care for them and their families when they come home and when they don't. No, the president did not elaborate on the types of guardrails or indeed the penalties that he would plan to institute around the rise in technology or look if it would extend to the entertainment industry, Ed. Right, coming up on the program, it's been almost a year since Silicon Valley Bank's collapse. We're going to speak with Orem CEO Stephanie Kirkpatrick about the lessons learned, what individuals and businesses have done in reaction over the last 12 months. Let's go back to NVIDIA really quick. Mm. At the session high, it was up 5%. At the session low, it was down 5%. We're now off session lows, down 2.8%. I think this is a pullback. RSI at 77, that means the stock is pretty overbought in layman's terms. We talked about it being at a fresh record and now the idea that a stock split might be on the table to make it more accessible to the retail investor and more manageable for the institutional investor. Either way, Nvidia euphoria continues. The stock is currently down two and a half percent. This is Bloomberg Technology. profitable in the US. We have, you know, very meaningful presence in the US. We have 30 million customers there. Yeah. Um, but at the same point of time, we are still 0.5% of the total payments market. Yeah. You know, there's Visa, there's Mastercard, there's Amex, it's tremendous big companies. Klarna CEO there talking earlier today to our colleague Tom McKenzie. And look, we want to stick with the fintech theme. We want to look at what's been happening around the space. 
the recovery also since, of course, remember Silicon Valley Bank collapsed almost exactly a year ago. Joining us now, CEO of fintech company Aurum, Stephanie Kirkpatrick. More on what the businesses, individuals have learned from this event, more broadly how you're bringing faster transactions, more deeply embedded into APIs that help businesses and consumers access their money that much faster. The joy of Fed now, not just crypto. I'm, I'm interested as we think about we're about to get a ton of media coverage on it being the anniversary. So, lead the charge. It's an anniversary since SVB really showed and poked holes in some of the bank's ultimate business models here. Have we fully recovered? Have startups fully recovered? Are people like learning from this? I do think that uh, startups are recovering. I do think the banking system is looking a bit healthier than it was a year ago. And I think what we've learned from it is that for payments, for banking, the things that are systemically important to running this economy, whether it's the American wallet, small businesses, commerce, you know, we get to a point where relying on a single financial institution is no longer sufficient. I think SVB's collapse highlighted that even banks of a certain size carry risk. And so what we're seeing with our customers and the way we operate at Orem is this opportunity to work with tier one financial institutions, systemically important banks. Mm -hmm. And at Orem, we now have recently reached a milestone where we connect directly to the Federal Reserve Bank as a service provider, which means that we're delivering on the complete promise of instant payments. And for us, that means our customers who work with us for payments, and in a lot of cases, faster payments, are in a position to have all of the benefits of lower cost, no downtime, smart, efficient routing, and access to all Federal Reserve Bank transfer rails, in addition to a portfolio of notable banks that we work with in the Tier 1 category, thus providing that resiliency and redundancy that needs to kick in in the event that there is something unexpected in the financial institution space. It does seem, though, that we've ended up with leave, leaning ever more on the too-big-to-fail institutions. I mean, we, we think about it being the ghost of the past, of talking about Silicon Valley Bank collapse, but we're still confronted by commercial real estate being an issue. We think of New York Community Bank Court that just got in $1 billion injection. Have you felt that people are reticent to work with the smaller banks? Have you had to say, look, we are with just the tier ones now? You know, it's interesting. I actually think that community banks, local banks, they do play a very big role and an important role in how we think about what's going on in financial services. At Orem is the simplest API for fast, reliable payments and instant bank account verification. It's important that we work with and offer services to all size and scale of banks. How we provide those services is diversified. Mm. And I do think that there is something to be said for working with smaller banks who can provide certain types of you know, independent variables. Some of them have very discrete protections under Durban regulation and other areas that provide higher interchange rates, things that are very good for fintechs, for example. We're building in the innovative sort of economy, but to have a single point of failure in any system, setting aside that it's financial services, is generally a risk. And companies, I think, are more eyes wide open to the fact that having that risk is something that isn't as worth taking as it once was. Concentration risk, I think, was the lesson from Silicon Valley's collapse, right? And changes were made. People were open-minded, as you say, to using multiple service providers. Has that made the market you operate in more competitive? Absolutely. I mean, I think what we hear from our customers and where we are often brought in to work with somebody in the payments ecosystem for our products is at a scale in which a company says it's no longer a good idea to work with one bank or just with a single payment processor. And so we are hearing from every part of the market, emerging companies all the way to scaled financial services, software and technology companies, that it's important to be able to diversify payments and banking traffic. And so, yes, we do see more and more financial companies that work with us have multiple bank accounts, which we absolutely think is a great idea. Um, and two, that they're working with a company like Aurum who can automate the process of how payments operate on the back end. It is two weeks or less to integrate to our API for fast, reliable payments, which gets you RTP, FedNow, ACH, same ACH wires, all orchestrated. And it's usually two right. years to go directly to a bank. And so diversification is a very hard problem. Multi-rail, multi-bank orchestration is also a very hard problem, and it's very high cost. So what we want to do is sit in the middle of this ecosystem so that software companies, technology and financial services companies have the benefit of diversification. They don't get stuck with concentration, but they don't also have to spend two years and $2 million achieving that when they can work with us in essentially a sprint or less of technology work. Stephanie, what data do you have about the financial health of those customers that you onboarded in the wake of Silicon Valley Bank's collapse? Well, what we One see year on. 
you know, a year later, what I'm seeing is just a big comeback, right, in a lot of ways, the venture capital market, the stock market, um, you know, lots of things are showing signs of optimism. And for us, that is also a very optimistic part of beginning 2024 with this new deliver product that we can offer to folks who are in growth mode. Connecting directly to Orem and directly to the Federal Reserve Bank means delivering on the instant payment promise and furthering our vision and helping our customers with delivering on time to value, right? Time to money is a very hard problem to solve for small businesses. And you think about wage payout, insurance claims payouts, you think about logistics and factoring and trucking, what runs our economy. And you think that most settlement has historically been five days on ACH and now it can be 24 seven, 365, literally round the clock on FedNow and RTP systems, we're in a fundamentally different place and our customers I think are really growing as a result of the capabilities that are available and I think we feel great optimism as we head into the year. Yeah, I remember the phone calls and the anxiety about moving money from A to B exactly a year ago. Orem CEO and President Stephanie Kirkpatrick, thank you very much. And actually, we, we agree Monday is the technical one year anniversary. Tune in next week. We will have Coastler Ventures founder Vinod Coastler join us here in San Francisco. You know, his whole thing was I was the first to make a personal loan to bridge the gap to our portfolio companies. But anyone that's on social media will also know, Caro, that <laughs> alongside Silicon Valley Bank, he's got a lot to say at the moment about some other stuff. Uh, coming up on the Don't show, say. we're going to hear from the HubSpot <laughs> CEO. Yeah, I, I'm really braced for that one. Uh, later in the program, HubSpot CEO on how companies uh, need to approach diversity. One of your combos. Caroline, what are you looking at? Look, we've got to check in on these markets. We were at record highs. Eh, no longer. Look, we're only off about a tenth of a percent. We've recovered significantly in the S&P 500, but still not at that record. The Nasdaq off more significantly, off by four tenths of a percent, and the Nasdaq 100. What takes us lower? Broadcom, of course, its numbers not living up to expectations, but NVIDIA also turning lower. We were up more than three percent. We're now down three percent on NVIDIA. So keep a close eye on some of this volatility as we head towards the weekend and maybe we see a bit of profit taking. From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. So Bloomberg just hosted its International Women's Day celebration in San Francisco. That was on Wednesday and indeed highlighted the philanthropic work the network does to train diverse business voices to be TV, media ready. It's our new voices program. There I had the chance to sit down with HubSpot CEO, Yamini Rangan, to chat all about her thoughts about how she approaches running her business, AI integration and diverse leadership and within her teams. Take a listen. Our leadership team is 50% women and our board is 60% women and people of color, and our entire leadership team is 49%, VP and above is 49% women. And do you think that's accidental or no. uh, you've been purposeful in finding those people? It is absolutely intentional. You know, we, I started in the tech industry in mid-90s, and it did not look like this. And I think what we've thought about di uh, you know, diversity is not an initiative. It's not an annual program. It just needs to be built into the DNA of the company. Why? Because we build products to serve communities. And if we cannot represent how the communities represent themselves, then bias actually enters and we don't represent the views of our customers. And so for us, we've never treated you know, uh, diversity and inclusion and belonging as one initiative. It's just built into the DNA of the company. And it's been intentional. You know, 2017, the percent of uh, women leaders was in the 30s. We've intentionally moved up. In 2017, the percent of BIPOC employees within HubSpot was 17. We've moved it up to over 35%. And so it's been an intentional journey, but it's been just part of building it into the entire DNA of the company, from recruiting to hiring to promoting to coaching, all of that. And when you look at your latest earnings, they've done pretty well. Can you prove, do you have to show to your other stakeholders, not just your employee base, but the investor base and those that have analyzed your company, that this is bang for the buck. Yeah. This isn't just intention for intention's sake. I'm done trying to prove you know, diversity with data. We just need to be diverse, that's it. 
Like there is no, you know, there's uh, as an engineer and as a person that's, you know, really focused on data, this is one area that I'm not willing to go there. Because there's enough proof. If you look, there is enough proof. If you want, you know, the communities to be reflected in your companies, you just need to do it. If your product needs to be unbiased, you just need to do it. I don't think you need to tie performance to this. That's just, you know, we're past that. I hope we're past that, but I am past that. I'm done. HubSpot CEO Yamini Rangan unwavering in her focus on DEI throughout the DNA of the company. But Ed, on this International Women's Day, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. What a ride for the markets. Yeah, what a ride, but really important conversations throughout the hour, which you can recap on the podcast. We love that so many of you are going to the podcast for the show, wherever you get them, Apple, Spotify. This is Bloomberg Technology.